Hey, welcome to Game Brigade. I am Brian, and today we're taking a look at Mythic Mischief and our first impressions look at this game, which will be on GameFound this week. I have been very excited to play this game and, and to talk about my uh, initial thoughts about it. Uh, I've had a good time playing through different factions, uh, trying out different game modes, different player counts to get a really good feel of what this game is like. We are going to do our standard first impressions. If you are looking for certain types of content, make sure you look in the timestamps down below to find a section that most interests you. We will be covering a brief outline of the gameplay mechanics. I'm not going to go too deep into this because Ivy Studios has created a great how to play tutorial. So we're not going to cover most of that. We're then going to dive into the things that I like and didn't like and then cover my final thoughts. So if there's anything down there that you want to jump to, you're more than welcome to view that section. So without further ado, let's check out Mythic Mischief. Mythic Mischief might come across to many different people uh, with different types of categories and names. When I played this, I, I kind of viewed it myself as an abstract uh, skirmish game, uh, especially in the two-player mode. I definitely really enjoyed that section, uh, but I could definitely see many people looking at this as multiple different types of variable uh, game elements. So note that I looked at this game as a skirmish game, and that will be kind of the focus of my impressions video. So if that is something you're looking forward to, I think this video will be for you. So we talked about that we're going to cover the over, like the overhead mechanics, uh, not diving too deep into the gameplay because uh, I don't want to drag that section on because there is a lot of content out there for you. The premise of this game is you're going to be taking a group of students uh, within a certain, certain faction that go to Mythic Manor. Right now we have the vampires and the monsters. There are uh, witches, there are going to be uh, zombies. There's different types of groups within this, this school. Uh, and then players are going to be trying to have the other players, the opponents, captured by the Tome Keeper, who is this central figure here in the middle of the board. The Tome Keeper is going to be taking a path trying to move to different sections on the board located by this one, two, and three. And the players are going to be trying to manipulate the board space to alter his path, move their opponents into different sections to try to get them to hit. And to win the game, every time the Tome Keeper will intersect or, or connect with a uh, player unit, that will score one point for the opposing team. So you're going to try to manipulate the Tome Keeper's path to eventually uh, hit the other opponent, the other player's figures. And this is done through many different ways. On the player board, we have different types of actions, and this game is going to be centralized around these actions. Now, every faction has two identical uh, actions, with top being move and the bottom being distract. And then the two middle actions are unique to their faction. While they have similar um, core ideas regarding interacting with the opposing players' figures and moving of the bookshelves, they all do it a little differently. And so that's going to be the first part of the asymmetrical aspect of this game. At the very bottom of the board, we also have a ultimate move that is an extremely powerful effect that you can use for uh, a one-time effect, but then you can later re-up it, uh, but it will sacrifice the ability to upgrade other uh, skills later in the game. And then there is a second option which will open up in the second half of the game board, which is called the after lunch. We have before lunch and after lunch, uh, which will then be accessed by the players. So on the board, let's kind of break down what we have here. Now, the monsters in this section are going second. So you can see they have an additional piece here, which is not normal for their standard setup. A standard setup would have the icons here. And they are represented by the dots here in the center that tells you what you're gonna what you're gonna upgrade to, and you would place the cubes here with the matching number at the top of that column or that row. So this would be a one two. But for being the second player, they are then able to place a cube anywhere within the board. I chose to go movement. You fill this up and you move these cubes over, which would then be two and three. These numbers <coughs> indicate 
how many actions they can do of that specific type. So for example, if I'm the monster and I wanna move, I have total of five different movements. Every time I move, I can scroll this down to indicate that I'm moving. So if I wanna move this monster, this box here, I would scroll that down to two. That is the premise of the of the of how the actions work. So each one for one, if I wanna do this ability to take a, a piece and fling them behind me, for example, if I want to fling this guy to here, I could then roll this down to, to zero to indicate that I have used it. At the end of the round, players will reset based on where they're at and also shift the cubes all the way to the left. So it's very important to notice on this barge, um, there is nothing here. So the next round, it will move to zero and you won't have access to that unless you upgrade it. To upgrade, there is a section later in the rounds where players are going to be upgrading their abilities. You have these tomes that you can be placing here to eventually push these up to get higher levels. And you have tomes in the middle of the board, which you'll be accessing as well, which will be leveling up your abilities. And that is part of the abstract, uh, not abstract, the asymmetrical changes every round. Because every player has agency in terms of how they want to build it. Do I want to be more moving and more manipulating your pieces? Or do I want to be more distracting or more of manipulating the bookshelves? Depending on how you wish to uh, approach each game will change how the overall flow of the game works. Vampires are the same. They've got move and distract. And then the way they interact with the opponents, of course, is different. So every... Uh, interaction with whatever faction you have not only are they gonna have their own unique aspects of being together on the board the way you're gonna level them up is different the winner of the game will be the first to 10 or after a certain amount of rounds once the tome keeper has reached each section and returns to the center the next section will begin so if that's before lunch and then after lunch at the top of the card it also tells you how much the tome keeper moves so on this one he'll move four on this lunch one he moves three so we'll change some of the dynamics of the board as well in a two-player game this is a standard setup in a three-player game there's a little bit differences there uh, but basically you'll have uh, less individual minis per team so if i was playing three players we'd have four uh, uh, people on a board but two and two versus my three uh, so there's different aspects to that it does change the game a lot so that is the overall arcing concept of how this game works the tome keeper will be moving the players will be manipulating the bookshelves uh flinging their opponents places distracting the tome keeper to send him in different places in an attempt to uh capture their opponents players uh and score the most points so with that let's break it down in terms of everything that i liked about this abstract strategy game okay so right off the bat when i first started playing this game i initially thought oh this is basically a strategy game akin to something like chess where you have specific moves and it's easy to see the board and go from there and i in fact talked to the developer and i said you made chess 2.0 congratulations and uh it was interesting because after you played chess has a very specific uh set to it where you can look at the board and you know exactly everything that potentially could happen and my initial impression of this game was a little like that but once we learned more of how to use our abilities and how we interact with each other it actually completely removes that idea and what i think the strongest aspect of this game and it could be depending on your play style, one of the things that we don't like, so we'll talk about that as well, is the way the game completely shifts between each round. You could sit here and try to set up a perfect play by moving over here. We're gonna fling this guy over here. We're then gonna distract the Tome Keeper over here, and I'm gonna move this bookshelf over there, for example, Some, something like that. And you think that you have everything locked. But then when your opponent takes their turn and all of a sudden the tome keepers over here and bookshelves are shifted everywhere the space and the way the map changes makes it so that there are an unlimited amount of options that can happen and there is no way to look at the board and have a clear idea of exactly the things your opponents can do 
There were times where I remember playing this and I was blown away by where I thought I had made the perfect moveset to, to trap my opponents and get them captured, to have them flip it on a dime and get me, in fact, captured and have three of my characters get, get taken away. The way that we can manipulate the board and adjust every aspect is a really cool feature. Now, with that, I will say there was an aspect of analysis paralysis. I pride myself with the idea that I don't take a long time on my turns, but because of the aspect where I was sitting here, staring at the board, trying to figure out every option that I could, I did find myself taking turns longer than I feel like we comfortably were, were at, to the point where we had to actually implement a timer, which is part of the game, by the way, to basically say, this is as much time as you have to review the board, decide your decisions, and, and execute. Um, and obviously the developer knows that otherwise they wouldn't have implemented the timer aspect to the game. So that is something to be aware of. And I was going to talk about that in the things that I didn't like. Uh, but I think it's a positive too in the fact that because of how well this abstract strategy game is implemented, that there is so many variable options that could happen that uh, it requires some additional thought and additional sit down, especially with a game that comes off as very lighthearted and very uh, kind of casual, I would think, in terms of uh, the theming. Um, it's very deep and it can go, it goes deeper and deeper the more every each player uh, knows how to manipulate and activate their different types of player boards. The other thing I wanted to talk about was the actual abilities of each character. They all have two unique ones, and I did find that some were more powerful than others in certain situ situations, but because you have the options to leveling up specific ways, you can mitigate the power levels of certain factions. Maybe the zombies have a better way of manipulating the board, so if you're playing the witches, you need to make sure you can manipulate the bookshelves more appropriately to prevent them from being able to have access to their suite of abilities. I like that there is that like uh, check and counter checkpoint in terms of that uh, aspect of the game. I think it was really interesting. And because of that uh, variable powers and variable levels up, I really appreciated the different experiences we had every game. The, there was never an experience where I felt like it was similar or, or repetitive. Uh, the different types of level ups, the different types of ways we we're deciding to attack each situation uh, really added a good breath of fresh air in terms of uh, a, a grindy, thinky game in terms of what we have here. So I really did like that aspect. The other thing that I really, really appreciated with this was the different modes that are implemented in the game system in terms of things you can try if you want to have different aspects. Uh, there was a blitz mode which makes your speed go a little faster. There's also a capture mode where if your pieces get captured, they're actually removed from the game completely, which changes completely the type of aspect you want to do because there's so much more weight uh, involved with how your pieces move. And the less pieces you have, the weaker you become. So while well, yes, by having one piece, I am less likely to uh, get taken out. Uh, it removes the ability for me to manipulate more board pieces. So that was an interesting aspect. I still think the base game mode was my preferred mode and the two player aspect of that specifically. But I did appreciate that there was more options that we could try uh, to find different types of gameplays to, you know, for whatever type of catering to whatever group we have at that, at that time. So with that, let's talk about the things that I didn't care for for this game. And I'll say that with a grain of salt because I think the things that we were having troubles with weren't totally negative points to the game. I think it was just uh, learning curve issues and, uh, and, and just light things. There wasn't a lot of problems. The game is very clean and very tight. The main one that I think I would make sure people are aware of is the analysis paralysis. If you have a group who doesn't like being rushed and doesn't like the stress of a timer, I can see this game being a little bit much for those type of gamers because once you get punished a few times, by having your opponent doing some really cool maneuver that you didn't expect, you're gonna to try to protect yourself from that happening again, especially you know as the board, the score moves up and maybe it's like five to six and you're like, oh man, I, 
I can't give you any more points. You could sit here for an easy four to four to five minutes staring at the board, trying to figure out the best solution to the puzzle you're currently facing. And what sucks about that though, is you may think you found it out and you're like, okay, I got it. I'm going to do this, this, and this. And then the Tome Keeper moves. And then when your opponents go, they then completely change the board again. So everything that you have pre-planned and pre-thought out is completely taken away. In a lot of strategy games or um, uh, dueling games, I like the fact where I can think a few turns ahead and, and plan, pre-plan. That is impossible in this game because of the way the board changes and the way your opponent's uh, powers can be manipulated and changed. It definitely uh, is not something uh, I believe is possible. One aspect I didn't talk about, but it does add to that, is you get a section where you get to boost two of your powers. So if I was looking at my monsters like this, I could boost one of my movements for a single round up to five. And uh, that changes what my options are completely because now I have a lot more movement. So again, one of those aspects of trying to pre-plan what your opponents can do and what you're gonna be able to do is difficult because they can change what their available powers are each round and how much they can use those available powers. So I think those are positives, but I also wanna make sure people are aware of what my personal experience was. Now, again, I, I had the caveat at the beginning of the section that I think that this might change based on more experience with the game, uh, having a, a deeper knowledge of every faction. Um, I tried to play, uh, we played a few different factions each. I really tried to learn one faction too to see if having a, a, a more experience with a certain faction would help certain situations. Uh, it didn't, it actually made it more difficult for me because now I, I started learning more of what my capabilities were. I was trying to feel like how can I push that to the maximum. So I do think those things are both positive and negatives at the same time. Oh, I felt more comfortable putting that in the things I didn't like, even though I do kind of like them as well. So hopefully you guys understand that caveat. The only other thing, and again, this goes with player experience and player, uh, the ability of a player's abstract knowledge is the balancing of the factions. It overall did feel like the factions were mostly balanced. But there were situations when we were playing, say, the witches versus the monsters, and it felt like the monsters' native abilities were more powerful, and so the witch player would have to spend more resources or brain power trying to manipulate the field uh, to combat the overall effectiveness of the monster player. So I, I can see players challenging the balancing, but it didn't feel like there was ever a situation where a certain faction could never beat another faction. So I wanted to make sure I added that caveat there. I do think this game has a wide range of abilities to add more factions. It's actually something I would love to see more of. If I were to uh, put a single recommendation in for Ivy Studios is give us more factions, give us more abilities to uh, play with and create different types of scenarios. Uh, I know there's potentially more uh, unlocks happening in the kick in the uh, game found in the crowdfunding you never know what we might have through this you know with stretch goals and whatnot but i would love to see more factions introduced with this game so with that let's give you my final thoughts overall mythic mischief is uh, a hit or a success for me I, I really really liked every aspect of it it comes off very um uh, what's the term uh non non confrontational you know comes off kind of lighter than you expect but once you start playing it it just keeps adding more and adding more and adding more in terms of what is available in the depth of this game i would love to try it again and play with more friends and try more uh, aspects of this game and see where i could eventually go and obviously by adding more factions or adding more depth to my pool they're things that I would love. I would also love to see more uh, starting boards. Currently in the rule book, there are three default boards that you can use and you can draft. Uh, there's an ability to draft the tiles and place things where you wish to have them. Uh, we, per I personally, I wouldn't say we, cause you know, you guys don't know my player group. So I personally didn't care for the drafting aspect. I liked having, here's a default board and use it. Um, but I would like to see more of those. Uh, these cards up here at the top, the before lunch and after lunch, were great aspects for 
uh, variability. I wouldn't mind seeing more of those as well because it changes the potential option. By having more of these cards though, you can actually have the three default tiles work because this changes the overall movements of the Tome Keeper and uh, those can add some variability as well. Uh, overall, I think this is a highly good game and I recommend people checking it out. I, I, I'm looking forward to checking out the game found and seeing all the aspects. Ivy Studios has so far not disappointed me with any of their crowdfunding games. First with Moonrakers and then second with Vale Fay. I've been very excited and happy with what they produced. Usually it's top quality products uh, and I don't think Mythic Mischief is going to disappoint as well. So I would give this my seal of approval and I am excited to check it out starting. I, I don't know the exact launch date, so I don't want to share anything if, if I'm wrong. But check it out on GameFound. It should be launching this week. Uh, this is Brian with Game Brigade. If you guys enjoyed this review, please let me know in the comment section down below. Really appreciate if you gave me a like and a subscription. I will talk to you all very soon. Thank <laughs> you.